It is 4 o'clock in the morning and we are back, locked and loaded, caffeine, coffee, caffeination, all up in this, and we are ready to talk about the best value tight ends for fantasy football 2020. Me talking to you, you guys hanging out, relaxing, kicking it back, taking your shoes off, of course, value tight ends for this year. I think there's a ton of value tight ends and a lot of them share some similarities in terms of last year. They sure eh, didn't really have a crazy year, but because of additions, people leaving, some uh, role changes, they're going to have some upside in their draft positions currently. Currently, their current ADP, their current average draft position, because of course, value is added or, or subtracted based on if a player is reached on, if a player is dropping in drafts, and exactly where you are pinpointing them with your picks in the draft. Is it an acceptable reach because they're such good value? That's what I'm all trying to figure out for you today, and I'm going to be going through a handful of tight ends to do so. So I hope you all are having a fantastic day so far. I appreciate it. If you could hit that subscribe button, big one's about a pop up and the notification bell it takes two seconds of your time. If you have watched any of my videos before, it allows me to reach more people by doing those things. So thank you so much if you are able to do those. And I have some free rookie rankings down below for the 2020 season. People need to get familiar with these rookies. It's the biggest thing that changes every single year in terms of just need to know 50 more potential players that might actually make a contribution across all the positions on offense. So those are down below. They're totally free. And I added a discord. I already have a discord for my, my Patreon people, but this one's going to be free, mainly guided towards NFL and season long content. So if you're interested in getting in that discord, it's totally free down below. People are starting to file in there. I'll be in there as as well. So check out that discord, check out the free rookie rankings, trying to add as much value as I can to this channel. So I have a question of the day for you all today. Fellas, would you rather have Evan Ingram or Darren Waller PPR redraft format for the 2020 fantasy football season? Darren Waller, Evan Ingram, let me know right now down below in the comment section. All right, so it's that time. Kick back, take your shoes off, relax, get yourself a beverage of your choice. It could be a beer, a water bottle, anything goes on this channel. Heck, if you're 20 years old, I'll even let it slide. But let's get into this video, starting with the man on the screen behind me right now, Hayden Hurst. Hayden Hurst currently available in the ninth round, the seventh pick, the end of the ninth round in 12 team drafts. How am I getting this information? Four for four does a consensus for your overall ADPs. So I'm looking at FFPC, I'm looking at a couple of other sites as well as they continue to go on there. So it's a little bit of a consensus, more of an average. So it's a little bit truer of a number. Seventh pick in the ninth round of 12 team drafts. He's going off the board at tight end 15. This is without question wrong. I've heard people on their podcasts have him outside the top 12. I had have heard them right around this top 15 number. I am absolutely flabbergasted by this. Listen, in 2019, his numbers are not going to look fantastic. Although the efficiency numbers will look good. He played in all 16 games. He only played on 39% of the snaps, but even the Baltimore Ravens leading tight end, the Mark Andrews didn't crack over 45% of the snaps. He got 30 of 40 targets, 9.5% target share. It bumped up to around 12% in the red zone, 349 yards and two touchdowns. Now, if we go back to his final year at South Carolina, where he came out as one of the best tight end prospects, all of his metrics were fantastic um, in terms of his burst score, his speed score, his 40 yard dash. Final year at South Carolina, he had a 15.9% target share. He saw 12.7 yards per reception. He was 14th last year with the Ravens out of all tight ends, 14th on a team where he was like the 2A to Nick Boyle's 2B at backup tight ends for the Ravens. 14th in the league with 11.6 yards per reception. He ended up catching 44 balls for 559 yards and two touchdowns on that around 15.9% target share, just under 16% while at South Carolina. So Hurst last year, though, was one of the most efficient tight ends in the league. And you probably don't realize that because he was a backup or part of this three-headed monster in Baltimore. And obviously Lamar steals the show and so does Mark Andrews in his same exact position. But he ranked 11th in average target distance, 7th in yards per target, and 6th in yards per route run. If you are not familiar, yards per route run is the best efficiency metric for any type of pass catcher, if it's a running back, a tight end, or a wide receiver per their route run. It's just telling you how efficient and effective they are on the field, and it's the best indicator of that metric. He also sported the eighth best QBR when targeted last year. So, I mean, he was just absolutely on fire in terms of just getting open, becoming very efficient with those jump ball contested catches. All of those things is where he was thriving last year. And now, and now he's going into the best possible situation coming from one of the possibly, likely the worst situation in terms of passing volume. The Ravens threw the 32nd most times in the game last year. They led the league in rushing. The Falcons threw the most times in the league last year. So you're replacing Austin Hooper, who in my opinion is a fine tight end, but more so thrived in that system and now you're putting in Hayden Hurst. Austin Hooper is a player last year who saw the sixth most targets, fifth most receptions, sixth most yards, and third most fantasy points per game. He was top three as well in red zone targets. Did all of that in just 13 games in this Atlanta offense because it was just thriving on volume overall. And now you're inserting Hayden Hurst, who is likely a more athletic tight end and has much better hair than Austin Hooper for what it's worth. Atlanta also right now is number one in vacated targets. 
They got the most targets to go around on the table, whether that's Mohamed Sanu for half the year, whether that's some of the Devontae Freeman, whether that's obviously Austin Hooper's targets in his role. There are a lot of targets to go around, and surely Julio and Calvin Ridley are going to be filling some of those, and maybe even Laquan Treadwell, but Hayden Hurst is going to be filling a lot more than the 40 targets he saw last year, and there's a really, really good chance that that number starts to double, and then the upside just becomes massive for Hayden Hurst. So Matt Ryan last year was very effective. 41 attempts per game was third in the league, 297.7 yards per game and 26 touchdowns. He was an absolute beast in this offense for all fantasy purposes, himself included, and he supported multiple top receivers like Calvin Ridley before injury, like Austin Hooper, even with an injury, Julio Jones. It was just fantastic. It was very vintage Matty Ice last year. The Falcons, just to get an idea of what this team is going to look like, you have Laquan Treadwell now on the team as well. They signed a couple of other tight ends, mainly Kerry Lee as the main backup here behind Hayden Hurst. Obviously, they ended up getting Todd Gurley, uh, and then they lost just downgrades, in my opinion. So they cut, trimmed off some of the fat. Devonta Freeman's out, Austin Hooper, Luke Stocker. So they ended up replacing most of these positions last year, and they got Matt Hennessy in the NFL draft as they let guard Wes uh, Schwartzter go. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I believe a former six round pick did not turn out too well for them. The durability of Hayden Hurst, it's not really that much in question, but he did miss the entire 2018 preseason with a fracture in his foot, played just nine games in the 2018 season as well. So I guess there's some concerns there overall, but nothing too major. Those aren't injuries that you expect to pop back up and really limit him. The tight end competition in Atlanta is just not going to be there. And the depth in general in Atlanta is not good at all really nobody behind Todd Gurley you have nobody behind for the most part Calvin Ridley and Julio I mean you're gonna really insert Laquan Treadwell you're gonna really insert Christian Blake that didn't work out too well last year when Blake had a step on the field I believe it was on Thanksgiving even so the, the depth behind just Harry and Hurst in Atlanta is Kerry Lee who's known as a blocking tight end and Jadamian Graham who has some nice athletic and spark score metrics and the Falcons say they like him but he had opportunities last year to do something and I mean he caught one touchdown a short distance touchdown but he just was getting no separation at all so there's no real pass catching threats at tight end to push him for any snaps at all so he's gonna be on the field a lot now the entire overall competition is going to be Julio Ridley Treadwell Russell Gage those are the other four receivers you expect to be on the field the most Julio played around 80 percent of the snaps last year had about 1400 yards and six touchdowns 156 targets saw 25.7 percent target share you had Ridley breaking out onto the scene for the final month of the season saw about an 18 percent target share but that target share spiked close to the mid 20s before he got injured in his final four to five games he was averaging around five receptions per game but during that time he was leading the entire team last five games of his season in receptions and targets and yards even ahead of Julio. Now I say these other pass catchers to let you know that these were two guys that were having a ton of production. Julio as always with his 1400 yard seasons, Calvin Ridley of course, this is just a guy who is an absolute monster and now you're in a situation where you're adding in Hayden Hurst for Austin Hooper who was already a top five tight end last year. Hayden Hurst is currently a top 10 tight end for me. He's number eight. I have him ahead of Austin Hooper. I have him ahead of right now Hunter Henry, Jared Cook, Rob Gronkowski, all those guys. I think I have him right behind the tier of your Darren Waller, Evan Ingram, Tyler Higbees, but I'm very high on Hayden Hurst. I've been taking him in like the late seventh round, early eighth round of drafts. I've seen him go there in some of the mock drafts I've been doing, but the fact that you can get him on average in the ninth round is an absolute steal because I, I do think in this offense, he has without question top five tight end upside, especially when you factor in injuries potential for other tight ends just in the rankings. I think he has top three tight end upside uh, with his floor really being around the 12th spot. So the fact that he's going as the 15th tight end, absolute steal in my opinion. You're not going to find many people that like Mike Gusecki more than I do. I ended up going to Penn State the entire time that Mike Gusecki was there. This man is the contested catch monster, and he's done that exactly in the NFL, which he began to do last year as well, being fourth in that contested catch area. I'm going to put up a little a little uh, snapshot of just some statistics about Mike Gusecki, his depth chart from what I put on Twitter. And there's just absolutely nobody behind him, as you can see on that screen. You don't recognize probably any of those names right now. Chandler Cox, Michael Roberts, Durham Smite. There's just nothing right behind him. But I urge you to go over to my Twitter at some point, bookmark it right now, and watch that video of his jump ball catch in the Big Ten Championship in Indianapolis when he was at Penn State. Absolutely unreal. And that's all the guy did at Penn State. He was just a jump ball monster, catching touchdowns, a beast. And he started to do that towards the end of last year with the Miami Dolphins as well. In 2019, he played those 15 games. He played on 70% of the snaps. He got 51 of his 89 targets, a 15.3% target share. Very good for a tight end, 570 yards and five touchdowns. The thing to look at is his final six game splits and then his final three three game splits. Final six games, he was the tight end six in all fantasy. 20 receptions, 248 yards, 
four touchdowns on 36 targets. Those are about top six numbers all across the board. Final three games of the season, he was the tight end number three, 14 receptions, 163 yards in those three touchdowns on 25 targets in those three games. Ryan Fitzpatrick started to love this man. Miami throwing the fourth most times per game surely helped at 42.1. He was seventh in route participation the entire season among tight ends. So in terms of how many routes he was running, seventh overall, 71.6% of the time he was running a route on a passing snap on a drop back. Seventh in targets, 13th in fantasy points per game at 9.1. And if you look at those final six and final three games he was actually top five and top six in those categories as i mentioned he was an absolute beast in college in the jump balls i i urge you to check it out a man was just absolutely chew chewing after a ton of touchdowns and then you're in a situation where he finished fourth last year in those jump ball contested catch areas with ryan fitzpatrick as his primary quarterback 33 and a half attempts per game for fitzpatrick 235.3 yards per game 20 touchdowns seventh and air yards completed ryan fitzpatrick was not scared to chuck the ball downfield and mike gusecki was happily there to catch it also fitzpatrick ended up rushing for 50 four carries 243 yards and four touchdowns so Fitzpatrick had a ton of production on the ground but still able to easily sustain Gusecki down the stretch Devontae Parker down the stretch this was an offense that started to really click now obviously when you look at some of the additions and the subtractions in the offseason whether it be via free agency or the draft free agency they added a good amount for their offensive line Eric Flowers they ended up getting Ted Karras a center and then they got Jordan Howard and Matt Breida so they bolstered their line they bolstered some of their running game completely really reinvented their running back game then they got rid of some pieces none really noteworthy two centers for the most part Andy Jones wide receiver that you really probably don't know too much about but the NFL draft you end up taking Tua and I do think Tua is going to start at some point this season I think they play the Bengals like week 12 or week 13 so I'm sure there's going to be pressure to go to uh, Tua versus Joe Burrow at that point we'll see what ends up happening but I, I do think there's pressure that all these quarterbacks are just going to start they always say ah oh, they're going to sit behind him nobody's done that since Aaron Rodgers so uh, it's a nice thing to say but it doesn't end up happening when you lose two or three games and there's pressure from the fans and you obviously just want to spark and you have a nice flashy quarterback put him in there to try and save your job so if that does happen we'll see how it does impact Kaseki as he's been starting to build this connection with Ryan Fitzpatrick. But if anything, just rookie tight ends never have success. He struggled as a rookie tight end. That happens with many people. He started to really put it on the second half of last year, which is around that breakout age and breakout time for these tight ends in the NFL. 25 years old is about the age he will be entering into the prime of his career. Very excited for Mike Gusecki, who right now you can get as a tight end 12 at the last pick in the eighth round of 12 team drafts. He's going in the 10th round of 10 team drafts. This is a solid tight end. Like I have Mike Gusecki right now, right around where he's going on average around 10th, 11th ranked in my rankings, depending on the day of where I want to put him at. So I think he's very much a value play at where you're getting him. Now I said the depth chart, there was just nothing there. You can see my tweet. Again, I urge you to go watch that video. Uh, Derm Smite, Chandler Cox, Michael Roberts, there is absolutely no depth. There's nobody going to be threatening this man. The overall target share is going to be Devontae Parker, Preston Williams as the main dogs on the outside, and then Albert Wilson, Alan Hearns probably rotating in through the slot for the most part. Devontae Parker last year played on 88% of the snaps, had over 1,200 yards and nine touchdowns, saw a 21% target share that accumulated to 128 targets. Preston Williams saw 84.6% of the snaps. Preston Williams is an absolute beast and people forget it. He's a value wide receiver, probably going to be in a separate video, maybe later this week, 32 receptions on 60 targets, 21% of the target share. But you have to remember, he only played eight games before injury. He had a 37 7 percent red zone target share when he was on the field in those eight games. Only Devontae Adams had a better target share of, I think, 39 percent last year. 37 percent. When they were in the red zone, more than a third of the pass attempts were going Preston Parker's way for those first eight games of the season. Absolutely unreal. You saw Gusecki's red zone receptions and red zone targets just increase and spike towards the end of last year. I think there's a lot of upside in this pick. Penn State product, Mike Gusecki. Before we move on, big old subscribe button is about to pop up on the screen. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and down below, the free rankings are down there and now the brand new Discord. It's totally phrase for the NFL and season long. You can talk about any other general topics in there as well, as long as they're loosely related, but get into that discord, totally free link down below. Also get into the rookie rankings, check all that out. And before you, before you continue, or before I continue, hit that subscribe button, notification bell and like button. If you've gotten any value out of this video so far or a previous one of mine, I greatly appreciate that. It will allow me to reach more people. I'm having a ton of fun churning out this content on a daily basis. So I appreciate all the support there from all of you. Oh, Chris. Oh, Chris, 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 Christopher Herndon, you were on these videos last year, and I felt really good. Felt really good about him, and why would you not feel good about him after a 2018 season where, let me read off some of his 2018 stats. 62% of the snaps, caught 39 of 56 targets, 12%, pretty good as a guy who has no experience in the league at that point out of Miami, and he ends up producing 502 yards and four touchdowns. Very, very strong numbers for a guy coming out at 6'4", 250 pounds, fits the mold of all these athletic tight ends, never ran the 40, but was listed as running a, an above average 40. And then you look at the 2018 
17 numbers if you just look at it relative to other tight ends on a per snap basis. 16th in fantasy points per game at 8.1 per game. Number one in true catch rate at 92.9%, gobbling up everything coming his way with a young Sam Donald throwing him the ball. Number seven in yards per target, number nine in yards per reception, and number eight in fantasy points per target. He was top 10 in efficiency as a tight end at such a young age. But the issue with him last year was the durability. The former fourth round pick in the NFL draft, the major concerns were that last year he was coming off a suspension, and then he ends up tweaking some things in practice in the preseason, ends up missing six games, and it ends up being nine games with just a ribbon injury and then it ends up being an ankle injury thrown into that and a hamstring injury was the big one and then he ends up going on IR for the rib injury and it was just terrible. The man ended up playing in one game, saw two targets and had seven yards with one reception last year. It was not good at all. It was just a broken year. You get suspended, you injure one part of your body, you tweak a little bit of a, an ankle after the hamstring and then the rib injury puts you out for the count. It was brutal. But if we're going to hold on to one, the college production at Miami, which is good to look at it, it was good numbers. And then what he did in those 14 games in 2018, really towards the end of the season, there's a lot of upside there for a guy like Chris Herndon. Sam Darnold last year was throwing 34 times a game, 232 yards per game, 19 touchdowns was a 4.3%. And he was starting to come out towards the end of the season. And now it's another year for Sam Darnold, as long as he doesn't get mono to take another step forward. They ended up banding Connor McGarvin as center. They ended up getting George Font a tackle. They re-signed Alex Lewis, who's a guard. And they picked up two interior linemen in Josh Andrews and Greg Van Rotten. So they have so much on this offensive line overall. They ended up getting Frank Gore. So lots is piled onto this offensive line, which is going to help, which allows just Chris Herndon to not have to block as much, which is where some of those injuries usually end up coming in, especially on a, a worn down body if it is going to be later in the season. So Chris Herndon hopefully gets a lot more slot usage. They're already hyping him up. I mean, the news coming out from The Athletic recently, uh, really a month ago in February was the Jets remain high on Chris Herndon. Yeah, of course, he looks so fantastic in 2018 as a fourth round draft capital pick. You're going to remain high on him. But I would say that there's some concerns with how good Ryan Griffin performed last year and the chemistry that Ryan Griffin was starting to have the, the tight end in place of Chris Herndon with Sam Darnold. Ryan Griffin had a very good year last year, so we'll see what happens. If Chris Herndon can just continue to do what he was doing in 2018, get healthy, not get suspended. I think that he'll easily supplant Ryan Griffin, who it seemed to be more of just touchdown regression coming his way. Ryan Griffin was scoring touchdowns at a ridiculous rate on a per target basis, likely not going to continue. The rest of the tight end depth chart is Daniel Brown, who saw some run last year, nothing fantastic, and then Ross Travis. So yeah, it should be a lot of Chris Herndon. I think Ryan Griffin should be sprinkled in a decent amount, at least to start the year based on his success last year. But overall, in the long run, it's Chris Herndon by a mile if you're factoring in athleticism and just ceiling. They ended up losing Robbie Anderson on offense, Demarius Thomas, Ty Montgomery. So there's a lot of pieces, a good, a good amount of just in terms of uh, guards in general. That's why they had to replace a lot of them. So they lost a lot there. In the NFL draft, they got Denzel Mims in the second round. They got Michael P. Ryan in the third round. That's a wide receiver and a running back. I'm very high on Denzel Mims as well in both redraft and dynasty formats. And then they got Mikel Becton, the first round tackle overall with their, I believe, 11th pick overall. You're looking at a situation where there's really not too much tight end depth and too much worry there and not a lot of wide receiver consistency. I mean, Jamison Crowder out of the slot was like top 10 in red zone targets at 30%. Chris Herndon can easily hit into that number. And then it's Rashad Perriman, who's now in his fifth or sixth year. And, and finally, after players were getting injured last year and Chris Godwin and Mike Evans, finally, then when he was a number one in, in an offense that was throwing so many times per game and Jameis throwing downfield, he finally put up numbers. But I'm not so sure that that's sticky and moves now over to Sam Donald's offense, uh, where it's nowhere near the same type of offense and overall play calling going on there. And then you have Denzel Mims, the second round rookie. So that's all the offense is. It's Mims on the outside, it's Prashad Perriman, and then it's Jameson Crowder in the slot. There's not a lot there. There's no alphas in there. Like Jameson Crowder is probably the alpha on this team right now. It could easily be Mims and I'm very high on him, but I'm just trying to say that there's a lot of upside for Chris Herndon's overall market share. There's a lot of just vacated targets going to be left behind by Robbie Anderson and Demarius Thomas, who were two of the top three wide receivers with Crowder for this team last year and starting three wide receiver sets. So give me all of the Chris Herndon. The only target competition, like I said, Denzel Mims out of Baylor. He was there for four years. We're on a 4-3-8. You ended up getting a thousand yard season out of him last year on 113 targets. He saw a 24% target share. 28 deep targets was very high last year. He ended up seeing 15.4 yards per reception. So he does have that opportunity to be an alpha, but yet again, he is a rookie and they're not going to have as many OTAs and camps. And we'll see if they even have a preseason at this point, which will help Chris Herndon a lot more since he's already had that experience the first year and a half to two years in the league. And this is the big kicker that makes no sense to me. Chris Herndon is currently going tight end 23 in 12 team drafts. He's going with the sixth pick, the middle pick, the mid pick in the 14th round, the 14.06 in 12 team drafts, tight end 23. That is wild to me. And I get it. I mean, I have him right around tight end 18 to 20. I'm jumping back and forth because I'm just trying to wait in ceiling. When you do your tiers, you should be rating in ceiling in that. Like, yes, Greg Olson is going to get some options. He's going to get some targets. And I have Greg Olson right around tight end 20. But when I'm looking at Chris Herndon and Greg Olson in drafts, and let's say I don't have a tight end yet, or maybe even I do have a tight end yet. 
yet. The upside in Chris Herndon is just so much more there. Sure, the floor is shaky, but you're taking him in the 14th, 15th round. You're not hoping for him to really shoot out and produce for you. You're just hoping to get something out of him a little bit, stable of the floor. And the biggest thing is the ceiling. His downside's already built into his pick at that point. I want to be shooting for upside later in my drafts. So give me Chris Herndon all day over the dusty old free agent Delaney Walkers and the Greg Olsons and just all those players. I want more upside out of my players. I want younger players for one who had an exciting breakout year and then just had a, a rough year last year. And a lot of people seem to be forgetting about him. Very similar to Chris Herndon, Jay Sternberger from the Green Bay Packers. He made me wait last year. I love the pick. Jimmy Graham was still there, do some money, but Jimmy Graham was so dusty. I was saying, hey, there might be a chance at Jay Sternberger, a guy who they took in the third round, 311 overall, early third round. Uh, there might be a chance that he actually gets in the field. He showed a ton, a ton of upside. I mean, he came out of college at 6'4", 250 pounds, had very good speed, uh, had an above average uh, speed score, had an above average agility score. This was a great tight end and he was producing during his time at Texas A&M. You're looking at him at Texas A&M in 2018, 48 receptions, 832 yards, 10 touchdowns on 18% of the target. He was an absolute bully, 6'4", 251 pounds, one of the strongest prospects in that draft last year. I mean, you hear about Noah Font, you hear about TJ Hawkinson based on their draft capital. But if Jay Sternberger was in this specific draft of tight end, he would have been the number one tight end overall. He would have probably been taken in the late first, probably early second round. So now you're coming into a situation where last year was just rough for him. He gets drafted and then he goes on IR with an ankle injury to start his rookie season. And he ends up being activated at the start November 2nd, I believe was the exact date. Only plays in two games in the regular season. In those two games, he sees one target, doesn't have a single reception, 3.6% route participation, and 11.3% of the snaps in those two games that he played. So when you're going to miss uh, most of the games, 75 to 80% of the games with an injury, and then you come back and there's obviously Jimmy Graham ahead of you. There's a Robert Tonyan ahead of you. Yeah, you're not going to just produce. It's not going to happen. But a bright spot for him was, although the team got blown out in the NFC Championship game, he caught two balls on two targets, 13 yards, and he found a touchdown. He ended up scoring a touchdown in that NFC Championship game. So he ended up finishing off the season with a nice little uh, a li- little glimpse of hope potentially for the following year. And boy, oh boy, are they hyping him up this offseason. Well, Jimmy Graham's already gone. That's of course. And now you have him with third round capital drafted last year. He's likely just going to automatically be put ahead of Robert Tonyan, who Tonyan hasn't done much. He was an undrafted free agent. So he's not anything that the team is committed to in any sort of way, like they are Jay Sternberger based on that high draft pick last year. Rob Davinsky is a Packers ESPN beat writer. He's very well known. He expects that Jay Sternberger is going to get a shot to be the number one tight end. I have this quote up on the screen right now. And Packers GM Brian Gutenhurst says that Jace is going to be a mismatch or he can be a mismatch. He's going to be a mismatch. And I completely agree based on the size and weight advantage and in the middle of the field where there's no more John Allison for them. There's no more Jimmy Graham for them. So a lot of vacated targets in the middle of the field to now have to be picked up by a guy like Jay Sternberger. And I think there's a lot of upside there for that. Once again, very similar to Chris Herndon. Last year was just a throwaway year. There was his rookie year where he was hurt the entire season and he just didn't get a lot of opportunity because he was sort of buried on the depth chart. Now he profiles out to be the tight end number one and an offense that sure, they might want to run the ball more, but they're still gonna have to throw the ball at least 25 times per game and likely 30 times per game. And your current price for him is tight end 26. Again, he's being ranked next to guys like Delaney Walker, who are free agents. He's being taken after a bunch of old dusty tight ends that I don't want. Irv Smith Jr., who's in a committee. I love Irv Smith Jr., but he's in a committee at tight end in a run first offense. And you have Jay Sternberger now being the main option in what is likely going to be a run first offense, but still has weapons there to have to throw the ball to Devontae Adam and feed him. And you can get him with the pick 1506, so middle of the 15th round in 12 team drafts. If you're drafting in 10 team drafts, he's probably going undrafted. Jay Sternberger is a fantastic option for me right now. Honestly, I'm fine putting him in as a tight starting tight end. And if it doesn't work out, just start streaming your tight ends. But if you're getting this guy in the final rounds of your drafts as your backup tight end, I think it allows you to get more upside. You're either taking Jay Sternberger or a backup quarterback, dusty old defense or kicker. I'd rather just take Jay Sternberger, hold on to him and see what happens the first few weeks of the season. His tight end competition, there's not really much. They re-signed Mercedes Lewis, but Mercedes Lewis is mainly a blocking tight end. Mercedes Lewis, fun fact, he is a first round pick, a former first round pick. He is the only first round pick that Aaron Rodgers has thrown a touchdown to in his entire NFL career. That's pretty wild. But Mercedes Lewis blocking tight end on the roster, not going to interfere too much with pass catching abilities. Robert Tonyan is on there as well. But Robert Tonyan, like I said, was an undrafted free agent. Jace is a third round pick. So just naturally, and we've already seen it based on some of the comments this offseason that I put up on the screen by Rob Devensky and, and Brian Butenhurst. It seems like Jace is already going to jump into that tight end number one role. And then Evan Bayless, who really hasn't been involved at all ever in this Packers offense. So it's pretty much Mercedes Lewis who will be on the field a lot, but mainly to block. And then Jace Sturmer likely profiles out as the main guy to catch some passes. Just to sort of hit home the point on how much Robert Tonyan was used last year. And obviously Jimmy Graham was there, but he still played 25% of the snaps. On those snaps though, he only saw 15 targets, caught 10 for 100 yards and a touchdown, 
in nine games. He also dealt with some injuries, but the team has shown some upside in him, but that was two years ago. They put him on the field a little bit to try and push Jimmy Graham. Jimmy Graham started producing a little bit more, and now it seems like they're all invested and all in on Jay Sternberger. Go get Jay Sternberger. Go get all these value tight ends. I will mention two two honorable mentions. Ian Thomas is an honorable mention. He's currently going as tight end 20 with a, a 12th round pick in 12 team drafts. I like that. Gerald Everett is currently going as tight end 28 after Jay Sternberger. I agree with that. Uh, I pick 16.07 in 12 team league. So the reason for Gerald Everett is they're going to run a lot more two tight end sets is what the Rams have indicated, especially through the draft, free agency, all of those things. And if that's the case, he's just going to be on the field more in an offense that passes the ball, is efficient, has a good offensive coordinator, has a stable and consistent quarterback and gets to the red zone a lot. So I like the upside there. And obviously you build in the upside that if something was to happen to Tyler Higby, Gerald Everett takes on not only the Tyler Higby role, but just the, the alpha, probably number three receiver option in that offense at that point. So those are some of the value tight ends, six of them with two honorable mentions, four main deep dives on them. Let me know right now the answer to the question at the beginning of the show. Would you rather have Evan Ingram or Darren Waller? And big old subscribe button's about to pop up on the screen. Hit that. I appreciate it. Give me any feedback that you would like in the comment section. A lot of people are just starting to find me because I'm putting in a ton of long videos, a ton of videos in general, consistency. So it's boosting up my YouTube algorithm a little bit. So thank you for hitting that like and notification bell. And if you haven't, smash it right now. So let me know. Let me know what you like about these videos. I'll continue to be doing them on a daily basis. It is a lot of upfront work, but the fact that it's getting positive feedback, I enjoy that. So let me know if you like these. Let me know if you want me to continue to do them. If there's any topics that you want to see. I appreciate it. There's also the logo up above is monkey knife fight. They do player props. You can bet on player props. So right now the MMA or when the, the NBA and the MLB and the NFL start to come back, you can bet over there, but they're currently running a promotion with my promo code. You can see Vetri or the link down below in the description, whatever's easier for you. If you want to hit that, if you want to get $15 to play for free upon your minimum deposit of $10, or they'll match you 100% up to $50 and throw in five bucks. So if you want to put 50 bucks in, they'll give you 55. Now you have $105 to bet with. So if you're somebody who already bets on player props and bets in general, you might as well use these promotions. Just try and get as much free money as you can to one, supplement just some sort of entertainment for you, but also have another chance with some free money to take home some house money. So I appreciate it. If you do use that promo code, that link, it does indeed help me out. So if you want to check that all out, I appreciate that link down below for Monkey Night Fight. Get the free rookie rankings down below, everybody. Get into the Discord. I want to start to talk to people in there. So be sure to get into that Discord. Say what's up. Say how you doing. Say where you're from, whatever it might be. You don't got to give away too much identifiable information. I get it. The internet, that's a weird place, but get on into that discord. Thank you so much, everybody for tuning into this video. My name is Sal Vetri. Hit the subscribe button before you go. You all rock, and I will see you all in the next one.